Welcome everyone to the uh, Don Dunstan oration. Um, my name's uh, Chris Orman uh, and I'm uh, uh, conducting uh, proceedings this evening. I'd like to acknowledge that the land that we uh, meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship um, with the land. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as custodians of the uh, Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. It's wonderful to uh, have everyone here for the uh, Dunstan oration. Um, in fact, um, looking around, it brings back some memories um, with uh, Bruce Guerin and Hedley Backman, um, who very early in my career, um, um, Bruce for a different reason, um, just as head of premiers, uh, and how he was, uh, he terrified everyone. Um, and uh, um, Hedley, uh, uh, at many times, uh, through uh, industrial relations and uh, as a former president of uh, IPA, uh, was, um, had uh, an impact. I'd also like to acknowledge um, uh, members of um, uh, state government CEs, the uh, Senior Management Council, uh, mayors of local government, IPA and professional members, um, uh, the uh, member representatives of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Warman's Lawyers, Flinders University and Technology One and welcome to the Dunstan oration. Uh, I also have to um, uh, um, present apologies for uh, Minister Susan Close. I had a phone call this morning, um, well, it was late last night actually. She's uh, been stuck uh, in another country due to bad weather, is about to get back in about another half hour, but that's a bit too late. And so uh, she's asked uh, me to convey her apologies and uh, I'll be interviewing um, uh, Greg this afternoon. As we uh, turn to the Dust at Dunstan oration, one of the, <coughs> at the previous ones that I've been to, people have talked about their experience with uh, Don Dunstan as one about a, a leader who was uh, wonderful in providing um, um, guidance to the public sector about being reformist and uh, other words like that. I remember Don Dunstan as a young clerk in the public service and the thing that stood out most, um, because I worked in the State Admin Centre, there were no security gates then, you just walked in, walked up to wherever you wanted to go to. Don would always uh, walk in uh, and um, say good morning, and say morning Premier, and uh, he'd go out to his floor. And um, the day came when there was the uh, tidal wave. Who remembers the tidal wave? Yeah, that was amazing. I, we had people in our office um, go to Murray Bridge because the tidal wave was going to wipe out Adelaide. <laughs> and uh, uh, Don Dunstan as Premier said that he was going to hold the wave back. He went and stood at the end of uh, Glenelg Jetty and held the wave back. It uh, didn't hit, and that was uh, something of, uh, uh, to behold. And I remember uh, the women in the uh, typing pool that I, uh, near where I was, they were in a rubber ducky in the fountain. <laughs> we had people walking down um, King William Street in uh, wetsuits. Um, it was amazing, but uh, we're all saved by Don. To um, uh, deliver the Dunstan oration uh, tonight, uh, we um, have um, Greg Combe. Um, Greg is well known for his uh, public roles as uh, leader of the uh, ACTU and as a Labor government minister. He's been a key player in numerous high profile issues, including the, uh, I could say, infamous uh, waterfront dispute. Um, about the recovery of uh, entitlements for former uh, ANSET uh, employees, um, compensation for victims of uh, James Hardy, asbestos products, um, his uh, campaigns against the work choices legislation, and um, carbon pricing and uh, renew renewable energy legislation. He's less well known in, that, in his public life has been underpinned 
by knowledge and experience accumulated from growing up in a winery, um, which I read about uh, yesterday, which is quite interesting. As a mining engineer, an economics graduate, community activist, superannuation trustee, bank director, industrial negotiator and advocate, communicator and campaigner. He has um, extensive hands-on experience um, of Australian industry and has been awarded member of uh, the Order of Australia. Uh, his book, Fights of My Life, um, dealt with uh, major events in his life, has been re recently published and uh, is over here um, um, to uh, be uh, purchased later if anyone would like. He's currently working in superannuation and advising South Australian Government on response to closure of Holden. I'd like to welcome Greg to um, deliver the oration. Um, thank you very much to the IPAA to, uh, for inviting me to address you in the Don Dunstan oration this evening. I appreciate it. It's a privilege and I hope I can entertain you a little bit. And, uh, I'll get stuck into it because uh, hopefully I might say a few things that are of interest to you but also when we, when Chris and I sit down and have some questions and answers I think there's an opportunity for yourselves to cross-examine me also and uh, that might be even more entertaining so we'll get to it without too much uh, delay. Don Dunstan, uh, I was, uh, uh, let me see now, 12 years old when he assumed the premiership in 1970, but I hadn't realised he was premier for eight or nine months before that in 1967-68. Uh, uh, but he was premier for about uh, nine years, as I recollect, in total, and was an enormously important and influential figure in national politics, in fact, as well as in South Australia, and influential for a young person uh, with a little bit of my background, uh, brought up in a, in a labour environment, was all at that time, as I imagine many of you might recall, when Gough Whitlam was walking the stage as well in the 70s and many things were changing very rapidly after many years of conservative government uh, in uh, Australia and in South Australia. He was handsome, very well educated, charismatic, an outstanding leader, tremendous communicator, a persuader, a progressive, a campaigner, a democratic reformer and a liberaliser. He was successful at four elections, nine years as I said as Premier, transformed South Australia, I think it is fair to say, removed discrimination, encouraged multiculturalism, supported land rights, abolished the death penalty, opposed white Australia, decriminalised homosexuality, democratised the electoral laws and the parliament, encouraged a culinary and wine culture in South Australia, introduced the arts and heritage to mainstream politics and society, built consumer protections where there had been few, dramatically enhanced public education and public health and the role of an independent and strong public service. He helped revive, of course, the Labor Party, not only in South Australia, but also nationally. I think he was, it's fair to say, for someone with my background, he is an icon of progressive politics and, most importantly, the values that the Labor movement stands for. Values of equality, fairness, social justice, all practised in a democratic society. So it is a privilege for me to be able to speak uh, in his honour in this address to you. I've also endeavoured in my working life to dedicate uh, myself thus far uh, to the values of the labour movement in the pursuit of equality, equality of opportunity, fairness, decency, respect for people, justice, social justice and respect for democratic institutions. And uh, as Chris generously noted in introducing me, uh, recently published a book um, detailing a number of the things in which I've been involved and which I'll, uh, some of which I'll uh, elucidate for you this evening. But um, 
the, the principal purpose for which I have, um, have written a book with a colleague of mine, Mark Davis, was to try and articulate you know, what the Labor movement does for this country and what not only me or Don Dunstan but countless thousands of other people have done in pursuit of those values of fairness and justice to contribute to the nature of our country and our society. And uh, so I'll speak to a number of those things, as I said uh, in my address, but pertinent to them, and I'll try and relate some of my remarks uh, to it, pertinent to them at all times are democratic values and democratic institutions, and in that, a professional and independent public service that can support the executive of government in pursuit of important public policy initiatives. And all of those things work together to make this country a decent society. So, with some of my background um, and how it informed those values of mine, I grew up in Rooty Hill in the western suburbs of Sydney, which was a uh, semi-rural uh, suburb of, of Western Sydney at the time in the 1960s, late 50s and, and the 1960s, uh, populated mainly by refugees uh, from the war, uh, migrants, post-war migrants who'd settled there from Eastern and Southern Europe. There were housing commission developments that were quite new nearby at Mount Druitt and it was a pretty poor area overall. Um, I grew up, as I said, in a, a fairly Labor sort of environment. My father and, and his family were strong Labor supporters. They were of a managerial class. They were all winemakers on the, my father's side of the family, winemakers for Penfolds. He was a champagne maker and table winemaker, as was my grandfather and his father, who had migrated from France. We grew up on a Penfolds property called the Minchinbury Estate. It was a very Labor environment. Um, I... Uh, my father died when I was 13 and, and we uh, left the property and I finished my schooling and I studied mining engineering and went out to work at Lithgow as a coal miner for a number of years, which is where I first joined a union. I was 19 at the time, working in a coal mine called Wallerawang Colliery out west of Lithgow. So I was introduced to unionism, I had labourism in my background, my mother's side of the family were agrarian socialist types from the country party, graziers in far north east New South Wales at Nimbin, and um, the values of her family were not that different from a Labor family, in fact, at the time, um, with highly protectionist views about uh, the economy and how to protect the interests of the uh, producers of rural and agricultural products. Um, the experience, obviously, in the coal mines was tremendously formative for me. The Coal Miners Union had um, been run by the Communist Party for a period of time in the post-war period. Uh, there were many communist and ex-communist activists <coughs> in the colliery in which I was working, and, of course, they were all enormously active in the union at the time, and that was the environment in which I learned industrial politics and how to conduct myself the leader of the Western Districts, in fact, of the Coal Miners Federation at the time, was in my colliery and he was a firebrand communist, if ever there was one. And uh, we had a number of disputes and uh, I learned a good deal, let's say, <coughs> working in the colliery about uh, relations with essentially British um, upper-class mine managers and executives. It was a pretty hard-fought place. Um, I went from there into uh, working up on the Cape York Peninsula in, mil in minerals exploration and later came back to Sydney and worked in community organisations and an occupational health and safety centre in respect of which there is a colleague amongst us in the audience with whom I worked in the early 1980s. And uh, I did so because and, and departed from a mining career because of my values. I wanted to contribute to the society through the labour movement in pursuit of the values that I had. I worked for the Waterside Workers Federation uh, by about 1987. I became a national industrial officer of that union, started to travel the country quite a lot from that point of time, visiting ports around the country, negotiating and representing people. Again, it's a union that had been controlled by the Communist Party for most of the post-war period. Uh, Labor Party member uh, officials 
had uh, one control of the organisation. I know it might seem a little arcane, but these were important matters at the time because they informed the politics and industrial approach and organisation of a union uh, in that you know, bitterly contested sort of Cold War environment in the, which was still going on in the 80s in particular. So that was very important for my industrial development. And uh, a man named Taz Bull was the National Secretary of the Waterside Workers Federation when I was there. He was essentially became a father figure to me and mentored me as a young trade union official. And he was a very tough bastard. He'd gone to sea at the age of 14, stowing away on a ship, having grown up in Hobart, um, travelled the world <coughs> during his teens as a seafarer, came back and joined the Waterside Workers' Federation on the Hobart waterfront, joined the Communist Party and was involved in some of the titanic struggles within the labour movement between the Communists and the DLP in the 50s and 60s. And um, so he was obviously, I remember we used to go out to lunch sometimes, a long lunch sometimes, and uh, it was a great education. It was like being part of a, a labour history movie, having lunch with him. I went from there to the ACTU as, and became an assistant secretary to Bill Kelty, who's easily the greatest trade union official we've had. Now, Bob Hawke's not in this audience, so I can say that without <laughs> any concern now. <coughs> he was at my book launch and I made that remark and I looked down and I saw Bob looking aghast. <laughs> So don't pass it on if you don't mind. <laughs> I know he's a native of South Australia, but uh, Bill was a wonderful trade union official and a very important work person to work with because in the 80s, of course, the Hawke and Keating um, uh, you know, leadership of, of labour at that time led the, you know, dramatic economic reforms to this country that have stood it in great stead for the last quarter of a century. You'd be well familiar with many of them and some of which we're dealing with now, uh, with the economic restructuring that's going on as a consequence of the closure of the car industry over the next couple of years. Tariffs down, floating of the dollar, <coughs> removal of various exchange and banking controls, and industry restructuring supported by government to help people adjust to the consequences of these changes whilst trying to do um, you know, other changes to support industries innovate and grow in response to the opening up of the economy. It was a tremendously important period and I learned a lot at that time. And as you would be probably most familiar with, I then went on to lead the ACTU for about nine years before I went into Parliament in 2007. I know it's a bit of a chronology, but I hope it starts to give you a little bit of a feel to my background and how I've pursued my values. I'm a Labor person, I'm a union person, I'm very committed to the Labor movement and have always been so in my work. However, that's led me into a lot of fights and <coughs> it's not been an easy um, working life to pursue. Um, the most, I suppose, um, um, if not notorious but well-known industrial dispute in which I had a leadership role was the waterfront dispute in 1998. And despite the fact that that was really only in the news for several months, it was a dispute that went for about 12 months and was very, very bitterly fought. It was a consequence of the opening up of the economy. And finally, the dynamics of economic change coming to an industry that had largely been protected because of its geography, being on waterfront, on wharves all around the country, it being a duopoly, only two companies dominating the industry and able to price fix and the capacity of the union to use the duopolistic arrangement in that industry to demand and achieve um, significant benefits over a number of years of bargaining with the employers. Basically, it was cost plus industry structure. And if costs went up as a consequence of an industrial campaign, prices went up. They were passed on to importers and exporters ultimately, and that's how the union had won a lot of benefits that were seen to be in advance of community standards. Along came an iconoclast in the form of Chris Corrigan, a business person who liked that type of industry structure because he could see he could make monopoly sort of profits out of it. But first he had to get in there, then he had to shake it up, smash it up, get costs down so that he could drive the sort of uh, returns on his investment that he was looking for. And that's what he did. 
he came into the industry, in fact, first acquiring, or secondly acquiring, a 25% shareholding in, in uh, what was Australian Stevedores and became Patrick's. He bought it off 25% uh, share from the government. He'd previously acquired a 25% share and then drove his other partner out to gain control. He then set about reducing costs during the 1990s, ultimately leading to the dispute in 1998. Um, and it was about shaking that company up uh, so that he could gain an economic benefit, uh, understandably, but also it had a profound level of involvement from government. People often ask me about that uh, DVD, uh, that TV series that the ABC made, whether it was accurate. It was called Bastard Boys, for those of you that might remember it screening about seven or eight years ago. And it was pretty accurate, except the ABC were a bit cautious about including the role of government in it. And government were critical of that dispute. Chris Corrigan didn't pull the trigger on that dispute and terminate the workforce unless and until he had a written commitment, a contractual commitment from government to meet all of the past service obligations of his workforce, which totaled about $153 million at the end of the day. So he made sure the government would wear all that cost. He didn't have to wear it. He offloaded all of that to taxpayers, thank you. And that was the condition that he uh, sought uh, in order to terminate the workforce and enact what was a political and industrial move on behalf of the Howard government. So it was a very bitter dispute. I can't remember one as, as significant through the 20th century, and I, I do like Labor history. There have obviously been very large disputes over many years. Uh, however, there was no doubt about the significance of that. What that demonstrated to me in terms of public policy making is how it can come, become extremely distorted. The Commonwealth Public Service were drawn into that dispute, senior public servants, by the Howard government, and I think it fundamentally distorted the role of the public service, uh, that occurrence. They became involved in what was an ideological effort uh, by the government, and I don't think that serves the community well. It's not the appropriate role for the public service to do so. They might have provided fearless advice and then found that they were excluded from the government's decisions because that was essentially you know, a set of decisions made by the executive to conduct that dispute. I don't think it's the right thing for the public service to become involved in executing uh, the uh, you know, public policy initiatives from the executive of that nature. Um, and yet it did. And I think that was a failure of leadership in the public sector uh, at that time, um, one that I would prefer never to see repeated. However, there are some other things I'll avert to which you know, suggest that you've got to be vigilant on this. That's not the proper operation of a democratic society when a democratic system of government in the public service plays that role. Another fight that I was involved in was the ANSET uh, collapse in 2001. Um, and this is an area where the unions had been campaigning for some time. As you can imagine, after 20 years of economic restructuring, a lot of businesses collapsing, going into liquidation and administration. Many employees being <coughs> behind the banks as creditors lose their accumulated leave entitlements. And when ANSET came along, it was of such a scale that we saw an opportunity in the unions to try and campaign to achieve some public policy reform about 780 million, thank you Tony, about 780 million dollars of employee entitlements was at risk but we acted very quickly and got into the court, got ahead of the banks essentially as the uh, lead creditors and after 10 years of hard work and of having a significant influence on the voluntary administration of ANSET, the employees ended up getting 98 cents in the dollar back and the banks didn't get anything other than what they had directly attached to particular aircraft leases. Um, that also helped bring about a fair entitlements guarantee for employees across the uh, workforce generally. Uh, so it was an important dispute for employees. We were able to work closely with the executive, uh, with John Howard at the time. I, I worked uh, to try and secure that important reform. I was also involved in the uh, fight with James Hardy over the uh, compensation for victims of asbestos-related diseases. And here's another issue uh, now that brings together law, 
um, public policy making, the executive government, the role of the public service, uh, in order to pursue what the community recognises as important values, and that is justice and decent treatment for people who've contracted a disease uh, when a company has known for decades that its product cause, causes cancer, causes asbestosis and kills people. That company planned for years in the 1990s to shift its assets overseas, build its operations in the US, reincorporate in the Netherlands where um, asbestos victims couldn't reach the assets uh, in order to achieve justice. We campaigned incredibly hard against that company, secured an agreement uh, with it that, that essentially hypothecates up to 35% of its free cash flow out of its operations in the United States into a compensation fund uh, that's been set up under New South Wales government legislation and to date, since the settlement of that campaign in 2004, that's provided, I think, seven or eight hundred million dollars in compensation to people. Um, we worked with a professional public service in New South Wales. There was leadership from the executive of government and ultimately, with tremendous community support, the values of fairness and decent treatment for people were respected uh, by the board of that company. I was involved in another campaign uh, from 2004 to 2007, the Rights at Work campaign that many of you uh, may recall that was an important part of bringing about political change in the form of the defeat of the Howard government, the election of the Rudd government and the institution of fairer workplace laws uh, for employees all around the country. And again, you know, values dro drove the campaign. Um, it was a, a position that we were attacking against the executive of government at the federal level over the um, diminution of employees' rights that the Howard government had legislated. Um, upon election to government, and that's when I went into parliament too in 2007, we worked with a professional public service. Um, we had a mandate to introduce the, the changes and the improvements to employees' rights and were able to do so in the parliament in 2008. Um, but I learned a lot going into government, going into parliament as a parliamentarian and as a minister. And uh, pretty soon, because of the background that I had, I think, and a number of the things that I had been involved in, I found myself being handed um, these hospital passes. So the first one I got was defence contracting. And there were numerous multi-billion dollar contracts that were stalled uh, with technological problems, with contractual problems, commercial problems, um, you know, aircraft not delivered, numerous uh, procurement processes uh, in serious trouble and the capa most importantly the capability that was anticipated for the Australian Defence Force wasn't being delivered. Um, I was able to bring some of my experiences outside Parliament um, to working with the Defence Department which I found to be uh, very professional and the Defence Material Organisation which is a procurement agency to just sit down in an active way for a member of the executive and start to work through the problems that they had. And what it demonstrated to me is that if the executive of government um, is active and engaged uh, but respectful of the proper role of the public service with the checks and balances that are necessary but with support, the public service leadership is able more um, more efficiently, if you like, uh, knowing that it has the support of the executive and some common strategy to work to, to be able to sort out some of the most complex contractual difficulties that you can get into. And uh, one of the um, uh, chief executives of one of the defence companies made the remark to me uh, uh, just several months ago that had we not adopted the approach of being very actively engaged with the public service and industry itself in sorting some of those problems out, his company in Australia, which has about a billion dollars in revenue, uh, would have closed uh, because of the problems that they had in contracting uh, with the uh, defence establishment. But there were many other instances where that was necessary. And I started to learn just how, I think, productively the executive and the public service can start to work together. I think you've got to give the encouragement to the senior public servants in particular uh, to express with confidence their views to provide ideas, to explain frankly the problems they're confronting, to have the confidence not to be 
thinking they've got to second guess the minister or think about the politics that the minister's got to deal with, but to be able to have an open conversation and to start to work through a strategy that is in, in the best interests of the Australian community and in this case the Defence Force. And we solved a lot of extremely difficult uh, problems in the period that I was in that portfolio and I'm very proud to have been able to contribute to it. Of course I was only a minor player. The, the real achievement uh, rests with the defence leadership at the time. Um, but they at least had the confidence that uh, they had a common strategy and position with the executive. I also around that time got handed the home insulation program. Someone was asking me about it, I think Chris was, uh, before I started speaking. Um, and this was a major public policy nightmare, to say the least. Uh, it was in response to the global financial crisis that that program was initiated, as you may recall. It was about a $1.5 billion program. However, the monies allocated to it were not particularly relevant because it was a demand-driven program with no caps. And <coughs> once um, you tell the community that they can get their home insulated for free, and the producers and installers of home insulation recognise that not only can they promise their householder that they'll get their home insulated for free, but you can make a lot of money out of each installation, the thing tends to take off. And it was a very poorly designed program, in truth, uh, from the start. That was because there was pressure on public servants uh, to roll out a program extremely quickly uh, that would engage as many people as possible, essentially unskilled labour across the country in a way, in a, as a means of, one of the means that the government instituted to deal with the pressure from the global financial crisis, you know, to engage essentially um, blue collar men, uh, that's predominantly who it employed, perhaps with some construction background, uh, in the installation of home insulation all over the country. There were 10,000 installers registered to install the insulation. Um, there was no technology system that could be relied upon by the Commonwealth that had never run a program of this nature before. We had to use, or the government used, the Medicare payment system as a means to pay the installers. The householders didn't have a role in it other than to take the phone call from someone pushing home insulation on them um, and opening the door when the installer came along. Um, there were call centres all over the country and internationally doing the cold calls to homes, so undertaking to install insulation for free and then claiming the uh, $1,600 rebate it was at the start through the Medicare payment system, in respect of which there was a very inadequate, almost none, um, capacity to audit uh, what was going on and to... Um, you know, have proper controls uh, to prevent fraud. And in truth, what had, all you had to do was to set up a company, or you know, set your, pretend to set yourself up, even give a dodgy ABN number, it mightn't be discovered. Go on the Medicare system, get a registration number as a registered installer, open up the phone book, and just go through, set of names in the Sydney phone book, and. Um, go on the website, the medical website, and claim that you've installed it at all these addresses to these householders and claim your $1,600 for each one. And that's what some of them did. And <coughs> as you can um, interpret from a program of a design of that nature, um, it was defrauded and it led to quite serious consequences, not least of which, of course, was the uh, death of four installers. Of course, the the issue is much more complex than that and it's been traversed thoroughly by a Royal Commission but you know, it, had, it did have tragic consequences for those uh, particular young men and their families. And uh, I was asked by Kevin Rudd to clean it up uh, when it was in you know, a fairly diabolical state of affairs by which I'm, I'm sincerely not reflecting upon uh, you know, the, my colleague ministers who had been involved in it. Um, it was a very complex position, which is a reason why I dwell on it for a moment. It's a circumstance where with government under pressure, you know, driving a response to the global financial crisis, all for very sound reason, you know, to try and prevent massive unemployment and economic dislocation, 
and to have programs there. It also had an environmental goal, of course, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It had a social equity goal of installing insulation in households, particularly for pensioners who could never otherwise afford it. Some of these goals were resoundingly met. Um, it had those goals, but the public service were under pressure to deliver something that they'd never grappled with before. No light program, no proper IT uh, platform, and yet it had to be rolled out. And um, as I say, that was with significant consequences. Lessons to be learned, I think, are fairly self-evident, aren't they? Um, you know, a fearless, strong, independent public service should never get in that position. Should never get in that position. Naturally, you know, senior public servants want to support the executive of government in a goal such as or the goals that I've described, but thinking carefully about program design, getting it right, going through the processes that you should ordinarily do to ensure that there's adequate risk mitigation uh, for a program of that nature is fundamentally important. It is so important uh, for the community that that is done. And I think that's what was lost sight of in the formulation of that program in particular. And uh, we did enough reviews. I don't think it really demanded a, a Royal Commission, but I, I don't regret that there was one. I, I just hope and anticipate that the lessons out of that are well learnt by public servants across the country because we don't want to see it repeated. So look, those are some of the things that have been involved in some of the consequences. I want to talk to you, though, about the principal thing that occupies my mind still um, from my experience of government and in respect of which in the public service played an extremely important role and where it will play an extremely important role in the future and that's the issue of climate change.